My question about Kongans. So s still, I think answering Kongan needs some thinking, because uh, like in Kongans, which I had before, there were some keywords where I had to like to find and to concentrate. Could you explain more? Yeah, Kongans need something that uses thinking. All right. So your true nature originally has no thinking, but it can use thinking. Sometimes it uses emotions or actions or speech or silence. So thinking is a subordinate, not a ruler here. All right. If you're attached to thinking, cannot solve the kongan. If you're attached to emptiness, also cannot solve the kongan. So the marvel of intuitive training is that you somehow grasp, nobody knows how, but somehow grasp when to use what in order to give a clear Zen answer to the Kongan itself. Because a Kongan is a paradox story. You cannot have a system for it. You cannot have just your cognition solve it. Smart people, they can go at least 20% with their thinking because they're very smart. Not so smart, stops at 5-10%. But then they get a Kongan like, let's say, Kobong's Three Gates. And that's when you can see the paradigm shift. That the cognition is running out of steam. Everybody believes that solving Joju's Hermits is wonderful because suddenly I got something which I cannot explain, yet I did it. It's true. You did that. But in retrospect, the system helped you. Because it's built up, thanks to Zen Master Sung San, in such a way that you can progress step by step. Otherwise, we would not progress at all. We would all have to go from zero to 100% as it was in traditional monastic practice. You got a Kongan for the rest of your life and in 10 years you presented your solution. And if it was correct, you may have gotten another one and that's it. Here, during a 10 day retreat, you have so many Kongans like they used to have in the mountain in five, 10 years, okay? And the system works. Your cognition first grabs the bait and then runs its 100 meters and hands it over to maybe your emotional intelligence, like in relay running, gets the bait and also runs. But then when both runners run out of steam, then something else is necessary. That's what we call true don't know mind. Not just your EQ or IQ, but your SQ, your spiritual quotient. Okay? The sun in the sky shines everywhere. Why does a cloud obscure it? This is a question which you cannot really answer by cleverness or based on your symmetrical mirroring technique which you are taught in the first couple of interviews. So the good thing is Zen doesn't explain, but it ingrains. And without explanation, you attain. And that's good. Still, inherently, thinking, systematic, cognitive approach they all help you. But after a while, just like the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, you're on your own. But by then you believe that it works because it certainly does. You just have to practice and go through the training step by step. Or everyone has a shadow following them. How do you not step on your shadow? If you get this as your first conga and you're just, oh, I have no idea. And you really don't know for many months or even years. But if you go through the initial steps, then your training helps you attain it. So first, small difficulty, intermediate, large, then enormously difficult, like the mouse kongan. The mouse eats cat food, but the cat ball is broken. What does this mean? If you don't get trained in advance, you can sit with this for the rest of your life and you don't get it. It's possible. All right. So Kongans are very good for our intuitive training. And uh, in appreciation to our great founding teachers and Master Sung San, he brought the best of the Korean Buddhist Zen practice to us. He gave that to us. Very few Oriental teachers do that. And he withheld nothing. He gave it to us completely. It's not just a few slices, 60-70%. It's the whole nine yards, nothing missing. 
So that's why we practice Kongan and we practice Dharma combat so that our karma combat out there would be correct. Life is a series of conflicts, sometimes battles or a period of war. If you don't fight correctly, we don't respect each other. If we don't fight correctly, we cannot settle our differences into some harmony. So our training has utmost importance in terms of attaining our true nature, having a strong center, and also using that in everyday life. And that's the biggest paradigm shift, as I've said in the intro, because it came out of the monastery. It came out of the temple. Then it has to be useful in everyday life. And it certainly is if we practice this in the right way. All right. Uh, we were chanting today um, so kamuni bull during the food offering ceremony. What I promise it? you tomorrow it will be the same. Okay, so I guess there is this is some Buddha. Could you explain? It's Shakyamuni Sokamuni himself. Okay. In what? Korean, it's called Sokamuni, not Shakyamuni, because the Sanskrit got a little bit morphed in the pronunciation, and. Uh, to give you an interesting addition, I am part of his family. So in Korean, my monk name is Sok Chong An. Sok is the Sok Kamuni's Sok, the Shakya's root. And himself at the back, who is translating for you beautifully, our vice abbot would be Sok Dok He. Manjin Sunim, who is on sick leave, he would be Sok Manjin, because we are all members of the Shakya clan. I am one of the family heads, responsible person for the rest of the family. When we cut our hair and we left home, we left our social positions, social stratum, whatever that was, and we joined the Buddha's family. This family has not run out of steam for the last 2,500 years. Plenty of genetic variety. So that's why his family is our mind family. We are all born to flesh and blood family. That's wonderful. Some people, most of you, stay there and make that family more numerous with in-laws and offsprings. And some of us join the Buddha's family in a different way. That's why we also invoke his original mind, pay respects to his achievement and his teaching. And without that, I don't think we would have the Dharma as we know it today. So I feel grateful. I believe we all do. So, uh, before I came here, some weeks ago, I did not have any experience with practicing Zen. I Good for you. <laughs> Straight into deep waters. Congratulations. I, I read some Tibetan teachers. I did some Vipassana. Um, yeah, but I knew nothing about Zen. And there was one uh, idea or concept that had, I guess, a strong influence on me because I had a, a strong direct experience with it. And it's the concept of surrender. I'm looking for ways to relate to it here in the Zen practice? Well, you surrender your opinions, your ideas, your dualistic karma. That's all you need to surrender, and that's quite a lot. So anytime your I, my, me appears, you put that down. In our lingo, we say, put it all down. In this intelligent, wonderful speech, surrender, or let go, or become clear of it. It's very nice. He said, put it all down, don't check. Don't hold, don't want, don't attach. We love him for that because he didn't kind of masquerade it. And I don't imply that those genres that you met actually did that. But I mean, the more direct, the better. But some people can take it, some cannot. So surrender here means put it down. Return to the sky. Return to the green tree. That's it. That has no thinking. That has no anger, desire, ignorance. And that's why nature helps us. Nature teaches us all the time. So I sincerely appreciate your presence tonight, your questions. And I hope that we practice further all together, attaining the very awakening that we strive for 
thus helping all beings, including ourselves too. Thank you.